Remember I said that uh, some Lakotas came into the Great Sioux Reservation and stayed there, and others, uh, a minority, decided uh, instead to, uh, to remain out there in those unceded lands hunting buffalo. Well, uh, roughly about two-thirds, about two-thirds of them uh, went in there to the, uh, to the Great Sioux uh, Reservation, which was divided into uh, three agencies. You, an agency was the, uh, basically the, uh, the government set up to uh, distribute annuities and to do uh, administration and so forth. There was the Red Cloud Agency, the Spotted Tail Agency, both named for their leaders, um, with the uh, Red Tail Agency having the uh, mostly Oglalas and the uh, uh, Spotted Tail Agency having mostly the Brule. And then most of the others were located, uh, well, the, uh, um, the Hunk Papa were uh, um, eventually located in the area that's now the Standing Rock Reservation. Most of the other bands were located at the Cheyenne River Agency. Well, in May of 1875, Principal representatives from the bands that were at each of those three agencies traveled to Washington, D.C. to meet with President Grant and his advisors uh, from the Red Cloud Agency, Red Cloud, and from the Spotted Tail Agency, Spotted Tail, who were both in their early 50s. Both of them had, uh, had fought, of course, against the U.S. government in Red Cloud's war, but had... Uh, uh, been very, uh, very important, especially Red Cloud, in the uh, signing of the, the treaty ending that war at Fort Laramie in 1868. The two of them had met President Grant before in 1871. This time, they uh, were accompanied by kind of uh, an elder presence among the, the leaders of the Sioux, Lone Horn, who was one of the Minneconju leaders, who was 85 years old at this time. Um, he would, uh, well, he was nearing the end of his life. His, uh, his sons were, would both be prominent. Touch the Clouds, who would uh, uh, be a close associate of Crazy Horse. And his other son uh, was named Spotted Elk, but uh, much later he was given the nickname by by white soldiers, Bigfoot. And he would eventually take over leadership of the uh, Minikanju from Lonehorn when Lonehorn passed away just a couple of years after this in 1877 at Bear Butte of old age. Uh, Lonehorn was also the maternal uncle of Crazy Horse, Lonehorn's sister, Rattling Blanket Woman, who, of course, like him, was a Minikanju, had, had married an Ogallala man who was also named Crazy Horse and, and had, uh, had a son. Since the Lakota are patrilineal, then his band membership, membership was the Ogallala, not the Minikanju. So uh, Crazy Horse and Touch the Clouds were very close associates, best friends, really, um, and they were also cousins. Turns out, the U.S. government really, really, really wanted those Black Hills so that uh, Americans could have access to the gold that was there. So they made, uh, they made an offer to these chiefs uh, offering to buy not just the Black Hills, but all of their, uh, all of their land claims. Uh, in essence, the entire Great Sioux Reservation plus all the unceded lands for $25,000. And in return, why, we'll give, you some, uh, we'll give you some land in Indian territory down in Oklahoma with all the other Indians whose land we have. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the chiefs said very emphatically, no, no thank you at all. Um, in fact, Spotted Tail said, you speak of another country, but it is not my country. 
It does not concern me, and I want nothing to do with it. I was not born there. If it is such a good country, you ought to send the white men now in our country there and let us alone. Well, uh, that didn't pan out, but not very likely that the, uh, the Lakota were going to be left alone. So they returned back to the, uh, back to the reservation. The following fall, uh, a delegation came representing the U.S. government once again, offering to buy the Black Hills and everything that went with it and anything that didn't go with it, just everything. And once again, the, uh, the Lakota leaders said no. Now bear in mind, these are the leaders who were on the reservation and who were trying uh, really their, their very best to maintain peaceful relations, but even they were starting to get a little fed up at this point. As one of the chiefs pointed out when the government representatives were pressuring them yet again to sell their land, you guaranteed them to us forever, just seven years ago. In November of 1875, General uh, uh, Sheridan, Lieutenant General Sheridan, and Brigadier General George Crook reported to Washington to meet with President Grant and his cabinet, including the Secretary of War, to discuss what should happen uh, next. And it was decided at that meeting they were no longer going to arrest trespassing miners. They were just going to let them in. And uh, they also uh, decided that the, the best course of action would be to uh, attack the Lakotas and their allies who were on the unceded lands that winter, uh, the sooner the better to, quote, whip them into submission. However, they couldn't just, uh, well, they could, but uh, they wanted to at least make some pretense of having a casus belli, a reason for going to war. So they sent, uh, sent a message to the uh, uh, government agents at the various Indian agencies on the Great Sioux Reservation, telling them that the negotiations of the uh, previous month had been uh, essentially um, undoable uh, because everyone wasn't there. All the, uh, all the chiefs had not come onto the reservation for the negotiations. Therefore, the agents were told they needed to get word to all the uh, all the Lakotas who were out there in the unceded uh, unceded territory that they needed, and this this was sent out in December, that they needed to get to the reservation by the end of January. Now, this was uh, this was a tall order because winter was well underway. And winters are pretty rough up there in the northern plains. In fact, the uh, government representative at the Standing Rock Agency complained. He said that he needed uh, that deadline extended because it would be virtually impossible for those, uh, those native people who were uh, out there to the west of the reservation to get all their stuff together and to make it um, through the, the bad weather and the wintry storms uh, to make it to the reservation. Uh, and he was told that uh, no, no such deadline would uh, uh, deadline extension would be allowed. And he wasn't told this, but essentially that's because it, this was just an excuse. They knew that the, uh, uh, the various bands wouldn't be able to make it in even if they wanted to. And in reality, they they didn't want to. Uh, some of them, some of them thought about it, um, and in fact had decided, well, you know, as soon as the weather gets better, we'll go do that. But weather's not going to get better in January, you know. So um, when that deadline came and went, and Sitting Bull and the other uh, various leaders who were out there in the uh, unseated lands had not shown up then 
the commissioner of, of Indian Affairs, John Smith, wrote that, uh, quote, without the receipt of any news of Sitting Bull's submission, I see no reason why in the discretion of the Honorable Secretary of War, military operations against him should not commence at once. And uh, those were the orders that were given. Um, it came down the line to General Sheridan, Lieutenant General Sheridan, uh, on February 8th, a little over a week after the deadline had passed, he telegraphed Brigadier Generals Crook and Terry under his command to begin their winter campaign against, quote, the hostiles. And so they did. And the Great Sioux War was on. By the way, I put together this handy-dandy little chart for you. Um, I'll be doing the same thing for the other side, just so you can uh, keep straight who's who, particularly um, these uh, next few next few minutes in, in this lecture. But any extra reading you ever want to do about uh, Custer and the Great Sioux War and Sitting Bull, you're going to come across these names, a whole bunch of different generals and colonels, kind of hard to keep straight especially since all the colonels used to be generals in the Civil War, and most of the colonels will be generals again. Uh, so it can be a little confusing. So I've got kind of a chain of command here, and I even went so far to help you out in case you don't know your military ranks to have the stars there for the generals so you can tell, you know, uh, who is starrier than the others. Um, by the way, the two colonels, two of the colonels on the bottom, Ronald McKenzie, good old bad hand that we've already talked about, and Nelson Miles, um, both of whom were called up after having uh, just spent the last couple of years fighting Comanches and Kiowas in the Southern Plains. Uh, both of them, uh, both these guys were in competition to see who would get promoted to Brigadier General first. And uh, the joke always was, that even though McKenzie was probably, you know, the uh, the most capable colonel, the most capable regimental commander out there, Miles had better connections and was almost surely going to get promoted first. And so uh, people used to say that McKenzie has Miles between him and his star. All right, well, uh, William Tecumseh Sherman, right up there at the top, general, four stars, full general, in command of the entire U.S. Army, Philip Sheridan, three-star general in command of the Department of the West. Now, once this war gets started, the uh, plan, the strategy is going to be to have three different columns led by each of these three guys in the middle row, Brigadier Generals Crook and Terry and Colonel Gibbon. Um, Joshua, I'm sorry, not Joshua, Joseph, Joseph, Reynolds and Ronald McKenzie, uh, both cavalry uh, regimental commanders serving under Crook. Um, George Armstrong Custer, Lieutenant Colonel, uh, serves under Terry, so he's part of Terry's column. Nelson Miles gets called in um, partway into this war to replace a General Custer. I'm sorry, not General Custer anymore. He's a colonel. Uh, <clears throat> to replace Custer. Spoiler alert, Custer is going to need to be replaced. By the way, I just tripped myself up, and it's easy to do, especially if you're reading accounts from the time, because all the colonels that used to be generals were generally referred to as general still, even though they were colonels, out of courtesy. Anyway, that gets us uh, to the beginning point of where uh, Crook and Terry, and then shortly to be joined by Gibbon, start moving toward the uh, Lakota and their Northern Cheyenne allies, and a small number of uh, Northern Arapaho, I think, with them as well. 